Alright, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is going to be our first lecture after the introductory organizational meeting that we had on Tuesday in Compute 416 or Compute 500. Um, so if you are on Zoom, uh, can you just give me a nod or a message on the chat telling me whether you can hear me well or not? Okay, cool. Um, there seems to be something wrong with my camera on Zoom and it's not showing my iPad screen for some reason, unfortunately. But I think the live stream on Twitch is working fine. So rather than spending the time debugging what's going on with Zoom today, I'll, I'll just stick with the live stream on Twitch. And if you want to ask me any questions, you can ask that on Zoom if you want to keep it in private within the, within the class. Um, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to work on fixing that Zoom issue starting Tuesday for our next lecture. Uh, before I begin today, I have a few things uh, to uh, just point out before, at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, as you saw yesterday, uh, IFA sent out a notification, our TA sent out a notification uh, on, uh, uh, on E-Class uh, regarding assignment number one, uh, which does not require any prior knowledge to this course. You don't need to know what's program analysis or what we are going to discuss in the course to be able to solve the assignment. Uh, you just need to follow a tutorial about CodeQL, which is the querying language that GitHub is currently using uh, with its program analysis engine, uh, and then write a few queries based on that. Uh, so just something to get you started and to get to know what you could do uh, with program analysis even without knowing what program analysis is. So I strongly encourage you all to start looking into that right away and just post any questions you have um, uh, to the E-Class forum or ask Ifaz during his office hours or ask me uh, by email and we'll be happy to help out. Um, the second thing is regarding the Zoom and the Twitch setup. Um, just tell me like, if you prefer to have only one of them rather than having both. It might be a bit confusing, I know. I just want to make sure that I have uh, two different streams, one for public, one for private. Some people prefer Twitch based on my 229 experience in the winter semester. Some people prefer Zoom. Um, so just let me know, uh, maybe on E-Class, on the forum, uh, which way you prefer. I'm happy to accommodate either both of them or just one of them if you prefer one or the other. Um, either way, I am always going to make the recordings for uh, the uh, um, uh, for the lectures available on uh, on YouTube, uh, which you have the link to uh, on the E-Class page. 
uh, and that uh, recording does not include anything that you say on Zoom or any of your pictures or anything. It's completely private. Uh, it only re it only records uh, what you're currently seeing on the Twitch live stream. So basically, my my slides or my handwriting and and, and my picture there. Uh, <clears throat> Um, the other thing, thanks to all of you who filled out the entrance survey, it does help a lot, like I said in the previous lecture, uh, just to gauge um, how things are going to go throughout the semester, because I will have an exit survey on the last day of the lectures, uh, and then that would help me improve the course for future iterations as well. So thank you so much for doing that, and if you haven't had the time to do so, please take a couple of minutes of your time and fill it out because that would help us make the course much better uh, for uh, future semesters as well. Uh, the last two comments that I have are regarding breaks in the class. Uh, so this is a, a one hour and a half almost lecture, and I typically like to have uh, some sort of a five minute break in the middle of the class because it's a long period of time. Um, so please, halfway through the class, if I forget, about the break, just ping me on, on Zoom and tell me we need the break right now and I'll, 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 I'll stop right there and, and, and cut it out for a couple of minutes for break and then resume again. Um, to make things a little bit more fun, if you prefer, if we run some music during those breaks, I'm happy to accommodate that as well. Uh, if you have any suggestions for what kind of music we want to play during those breaks, please let us know on the eClass uh, forum or email me personally if you want. Uh, I'll be happy to accommodate that as well, uh, starting from the next lecture. Uh, I see there is a course uh, question there. Uh, if you missed the first lecture, everything is recorded in that YouTube video. And if you go to the course schedule on the eClass page, you will see uh, the day where we have a lecture and the topic, if the topic is in green, that means it's going to be a link to the YouTube recording of that day. So just click on it, watch the recording, and see if there's any important information that you have missed or not. Uh, for the lecture that we had on Tuesday, uh, I basically went through every single detail that we have uh, on eClass. You're welcome, Ridwan. Uh, on eClass, such that uh, you know what kind of deadlines we have in the course, what kind of course deliverables are expected from you, uh, what is the course project about, uh, what is the paper report and the project report and uh, the proposal when everything is due, the responsibilities of myself, Ifaz, and you as well uh, in the course, <clears throat> as well as went briefly through some of the topics that we're going to discuss in the class. Uh, so just a basic introductory uh, lecture for the course on how it's going to run uh, throughout the rest of the semester. Um, these are pretty much all the announcements that I had for today. Uh, before I go on, do you have any questions for me? All right. I guess we are good to go then. So, throughout the lectures uh, of this course, I will use a mix of some handwriting as if it's a whiteboard and some slides and some writing on slides. So, uh, I'll, if, if I use slides at any point in the class, like I will do today, for example, I will make them available to you and I will have a link on eClass to where you can find those slides so you can uh, print them out or uh, use them in your uh, tablet or whatever e-reader that you want to use. Uh, so I'll make them available to you. Um, if you need any other kind of accommodation or any other kind of uh, uh, permission, for example, to record things or do whatever you want uh, with the content of the course, please reach out to me. Let me know. I'll be happy to accommodate anything that you may need uh, to make this experience as best as possible and as best as we can and to have a, a, a you enjoy your experience throughout the course until the end of the semester. So please don't hesitate to reach out if, if you have any requests that uh, uh, you want me to look into or you want to have for the course. And with that out of the way, let's uh, dive in right away. So uh, today's topic, uh, we are going to talk about uh, the first topic that we're going to have in this course, uh, which is intermediate representations. 
Uh, we briefly talked about them. I mean, not, we didn't really talk about them in the previous lecture. We just had a question about them in the uh, entrance survey. Um, so a quick disclaimer before I continue moving on with the slides of today. Uh, some of the material that I'm going to present in the course is based on top uh, of is based on work done by other instructors out there, uh, specifically Andre Lodek uh, with his course CS744 at Waterloo, and uh, Eric Boden at TU Darmstadt uh, with his course uh, designing code analysis frameworks. Uh, today's topic, we're going to discuss two things. We're going to go quickly through some sample static analyses, so that just to give you a flavor of what static analysis is capable of doing. Uh, and we're also going to know the very first thing that you need to know uh, about program analysis, which is intermediate representations of programs and how to deal with different uh, uh, levels of precision of intermediate representations and what are the trade-offs that come in place there in designing intermediate representations for program analysis frameworks. So, uh, I take it that all of you here, you think you can code, right? Otherwise, you may not be in computing science or you may not take a programming language course. Uh, and given that, I have a couple of questions for you. And please do answer, uh, ideally, the slides are not showing properly on Zoom. Uh, yes, I am seeing that right now, unfortunately. I don't know why Zoom is not picking up my, my content that is on Twitch, but I'll try to fix that for the upcoming lectures rather than spending time doing that right now. Uh, everything works until the point when I start the lecture and then things don't work anymore. So I apologize for that. I'll try to do more testing uh, later. But the recording that will be available on YouTube would be whatever you're seeing on Twitch. So uh, all the content will be there. All right. So my first question to you all today is, what would be the output of this line of code there? Anyone? So this is a line in Java. If you execute that line, what will be the output that you get? It will just print out hello world, right? Good. How about now? What will be the output that will be uh, generated by this line, by this piece of code here? I'm hearing somebody speaking, but it's very faint. So I think something is wrong maybe with your mic. Is that? Yeah. Can you repeat again what you said, Justin? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so at this point, like in the previous example, we were able to say right away, just looking at the code, that it is going to be hello world. But right now, the answer is, well, it depends. Depends on what? Depends on the value of the condition. So statically, at compile time, when I'm looking at this piece of code, I won't be able to know right away what will be the output of that program. Because it depends on some computation that I will not know the value of until the point when I run the program. How about now? Would this piece of code here with this code snippet, again written in, in a language that is very similar to Java or just Java, uh, what would be the errors that this program may generate, if any, and why? Just give you a few more seconds uh, to look at it and before you can respond. All right, so we have here. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> mm 
Right, exactly. So as a couple of you already have said is, in this line here, I may get an index out of range exception. And why is it a may? It's a may because of this arbitrary computation again. Just like we mentioned in the previous example that if this arbitrary computation yields true, so the condition is true, so that means that I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> that means that I'm going to look at the, um, uh, that I'm going to execute the body of the loop and in that case if I do execute the body of the loop the array is of size 6 but here I'm accessing the 10th element of the array or array index number 10 and that would yield an array index out of range but again this is a may because I don't know this piece of code when I get to run it whether I would actually execute the body of the loop or not all right so generally speaking if you want to answer any of those interesting uh, uh, properties about a program, uh, for any interesting property, PR, of the behavior of the program, like any of those questions that we were just asking, uh, it is going to be impossible to write an analysis, a static analysis that is, or a program analysis, that can decide for every program P whether that property holds for P or not. And this is basically Rice's theorem. You cannot possibly write a program that can check whether for any interesting property, and what do I mean by interesting here? I don't mean something that you can deduce just by a quick skim through the code, like class A is a subclass of class B because you have an inheritance relationship between them. So something that requires uh, uh, more than just uh, a syntactical check in the program, something that maybe depends on the control flow in the, of the program or the data flow in the program. Uh, so an interesting property is going to be impossible for us to write uh, an analysis that can decide whether that property holds or not for the program. So by definition, everything that is static analysis is going to be undecidable. Anything that we're going to talk about in this course is going to say, well, this problem is going to be undecidable. But does that mean that we are doomed? Does that mean that this is the last lecture we're going to have this semester? Does that mean that nobody was working on static analysis anymore? Of course not. That's not the case. And why is it not the case? It's going to be all the research that we're trying to do, myself and my colleagues in the community that we're trying to do in static analysis, is precisely to try to find approximations for that answer to that question about property PR. We're trying to approximate what would be the possible answer to that question without just giving up right away. So we want to make that approximation as good as possible. And the reason is you have a property P and you have an analysis that you can run it on and you can always answer a yes or a maybe, right? Alternatively, you can have the same property P and you can run an analysis on it and you can answer either a no or a maybe. So the, pro the difference here is that the answer to the question might be maybe, I don't know, so I'm just going to say maybe, or I know for sure that it is true or I know for sure that it is not true. And the key thing here is that we want to make sure that those maybes here, we want to make those as few as possible. Because these are the ones that cause imprecision in static analysis. And if we try to avoid them as much as we can and try to fall into the buckets of either a yes or a definitive no, then our analysis will be more useful. We can use it in more practical settings. We can avoid false positives and so on and so forth. So this is basically is going to be our task throughout this uh, course. We're going to try to find ways to define static analyses such that the answer to our analysis or, or our analysis will be able to answer that question about the property that we are interested in with either a definitive yes and a definitive no and having as few as possible answers that are maybes. So what are some sample analyses that we can uh, 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 see in, in this course or, or in practice? So some of those sample analyses, I briefly talked about some of them in the first lecture, but I'm just going to go over a few of them again. The first example here is constant propagation. So constant propagation is a very famous compiler optimization technique that uses static analysis to figure out, for example, here I have the expression a plus b. Instead of having the expression a plus b executed maybe in a loop, for example, if you're looping over thousands of elements, you don't have to execute it every single time you know that a is a constant value, b is another constant value, so you can just replace this value with 3 right away. 
and you avoid one addition uh, instruction in, in, in your loop, which would consume about four to five cycles if you're using a MIPS architecture, like you have probably studied in 229. So this analysis reduces the number of calculations required in your program and improves the performance runtime of the application. Another very famous uh, optimization or example of static analysis is dead code elimination. Um, for example, you might have your piece of code here, and this code here says that I'm going to have some print statements all the way throughout my program, uh, but they are only going to show up if I have the debug flag enabled. So if you have the debug flag enabled, those print statements are going to show up and are going to print some uh, debugging diagnostic information, for example, that will allow you to uh, navigate your way through the program and figure out what exactly is going on if you, are, if you are debugging the program. But if you are deploying this program in production, you don't want this, these printout print statements to be printed out because this is just going to be noise for your users. So how do you do that when you deploy your program? Well, the compiler will just say, well, I'm seeing that my debug flag is false, right? Because I'm setting it to false in, in deployment, so I'm not going to generate any code for it. I'm just going to completely eliminate that piece of code uh, at runtime. And this would enable you to reduce app size, for example. And this is used quite often in mobile device applications uh, when you're developing them because you're debugging a whole bunch of stuff. You don't want that to go into production. So the compiler will just eliminate those uh, from production. Another type of analysis is called type state analysis. So type state analysis because it tracks the state uh, of uh, a given object or a given uh, type in your program, figuring out whether uh, it may end up in an invalid state according to some type state machine uh, that it should follow or not. So in this example here, we have some file A. We're opening that file. Uh, we're creating the file first, and then we're opening it here. And then we're creating another file B. We have some if statement here, and then we're closing the file B. And the question that we want to answer here is, uh, at this point in the program, are we closing all the file resources that we have or not? The type state analysis would be able to detect any such resource leaks in your program by tracking those objects and whether all of them will end up in, an, in, in, in a valid state at the end of, the, of their lifetime throughout the program or not. So these are some of the sample analyses that uh, static analysis is very useful in, in implementing. And you're going to see a few of those examples as well as we go throughout the semester, whether in the assignments, whether in the examples that we're going to have in class, whether in the papers that we're going to read later on in the course, and so on and so forth. I'm going to stop here for a second, and I'm going to ask you if you have any questions for me so far regarding either the sample analyses or Rice's theorem or the theory uh, of program analysis that we briefly talked about so far before we move on uh, to the other part of the lecture, which is the intermediate representations. You can either respond with the reaction on the Zoom chat, maybe, or the reaction on the Zoom thingy itself, or just nod or anything that would enable me to know what are you thinking about given that virtual interaction that we're having instead of the classroom interaction that we usually have. Cool. Somebody figured out how to use reactions on Zoom. All right. Um, I'll take it then that, that there are no questions so far, so I'm just going to move on to the next part. So now that we have talked about in uh, some sample analyses, how do we actually get to implement those analyses? The very first thing that you would implement in a static analysis or a static analysis framework is something called intermediate representation, which is you have your high-level language, you have your high-level program in Java or C or C++ or Scala or Python or JavaScript, or whatever language, or Kotlin, or whatever language you have, and you want to analyze it. So yes, you can just analyze the code right away, the text that you have, but, that's, but basically that means you're going to have to implement a parser or a compiler of some sort. Uh, typically what people do is that they want to transform that code into some lower level language, 
that is easier for, 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 uh, for analysis designers and analysis engineers to write analyses on. Uh, and that language may, may actually be the target of multiple other languages, so you can have a cross-language analysis uh, implemented on top of this intermediate representation. Compilers on themselves actually use intermediate representations to be able to lower down or translate that high-level language into machine-executable code uh, uh, in their backend. So we're going to see some of those intermediate representations now. We're going to see what is the trade-off between some of them versus the others, when to use which one of them, and so on and so forth uh, from now until the end of this lecture today. All right, so intermediate representations in general, they follow this kind of hierarchy. So you start from the source code, and your target is going all the way to the target code. So this, let's say this, is, this could be you're starting here from Java, and your target code is x86, for example. Uh, so just to give some concrete examples about that. And then in between the source code and the target code, you may have a high level IR, a medium level IR, a low level IR. And we're going to see what does it mean to have a high level IR, a medium level IR, a low level IR, and the different trade offs between them. So we'll start with this example here and we'll see as we go further down in this hierarchy how those IRs would look like. So this example here is in a language, let's say, a Java-like language, uh, and it's a while loop, so it's while i less than 10, uh, if i is, all, is less than 10, or as long as i is less than 10, uh, we're going to accumulate a sum plus 2 multiplied by the array element at this i index. So this is going to be the high-level language. If you want to have an, uh, another representation of this, is typically the first thing that a compiler would generate, which is a parse tree, or an abstract syntax tree. So this abstract syntax tree is just a tree representation for the terms and the symbols that are represented in this statement here. So here you have the top of the tree is the while statement. Here you have the condition as the left-hand side of the tree. On the right-hand side of the tree, you have the expression, the equals, the assignment expression. And basically, it's a binary tree. Uh, so every element in that tree would have two children at most. Uh, here you have the array axis and then you have the multiplication and the way you're going to uh, uh, translate that high level statement into this abstract syntax tree is that you're going to follow the precedence uh, of the operators that you have. So here the precedence would go first to the array elements and then the multiplication and then the addition and then the assignment and so on. So this is one example of an intermediate representation. Abstract syntax tree or sometimes it's called for short AST or ASTs. So you will see that term quite used quite often throughout the course as well. Another version of an AST or an abstract syntax tree is an annotated abstract syntax tree. And it's basically the same tree, but on top of the current information that you see there, we annotate the abstract syntax tree with information like type information. So here, for example, I can say that i is going to be of type int, 10, I'm going to deal with that as int, um, for example, here, uh, this is going to be uh, a is an integer array, so the whatever you're going to get from that array axis is going to be integer, and 2 is going to be an integer, and then that multiplication is going to be integer, and then this summation is going to be integer, and then this assignment is going to be an integer assignment. And this would give more information regarding some of the expressions and some of the operations that we are allowed to do and maybe not allowed to do in some cases here. So types is one of them. You can annotate the abstract index tree with line of code just to be able, for example, if you want to print out uh, error messages to the developer, uh, you want to know where exactly you are going to highlight those uh, in the program. So you want to make sure that you are able to do so properly. So you need the line of code uh, in there. Another type of an intermediate representation is uh, something called three address code. And this is used quite often in, in many of the analysis frameworks that we're going to see in this course. Uh, and why is it called three address code? Because every statement that we have in this code here, in this intermediate representation, can have at most three addresses to deal with. So three addresses or three variables to deal with. So in this example here, we have T1, that's an I. 10 basically is a constant, so we have two addresses that we can deal with. In this if statement, we have t1. Um, let's say in this statement down here, we have t3 
A and T2, and you will never be able to find any statement that will have more than three addresses uh, to deal with, either to read from or to write to. So that's what three address code uh, looks like. Um, all these representations, if you notice, they are for the same line of code in the high level language. So you can have the same line of code translated into different intermediate representations depending on uh, what are you gonna, you're going to use it for and what your needs as an analysis engineer or analysis designers are. Another intermediate representation, again, that is more abstract than three address code is a control flow graph. So this is the second graph-like structure that we have seen uh, in intermediate representations in addition to the abstract syntax tree. So here, um, we would represent things re based on nodes will contain statements or maybe a group of statements called basic blocks. Uh, and edges would represent the control flow from one statement to the other. So for example, here we have the condition of the while loop. And here uh, we have, if it's false, that means we're going to exit the loop. We don't want to we don't want to execute the body of the loop, so what does that mean? It means we're going to jump to the next statement, whatever that next statement is. If the body of the loop, if the condition of the loop is true, that means we're going to execute the loop. So here's the execution of the loop, which is that statement here, and then we're going to loop back to evaluate the condition again afterwards. So this is yet another representation of uh, the same line of code uh, that we're going to see as intermediate representation. And we're going to see all those representations interchangeably throughout the course, depending on how we want to look at the program, the input program that we want to analyze, and what kind of information we want to get out of it, and what kind of analyses uh, and analysis queries, or, ana or what kind of questions our analysis uh, wants to answer, what kind of properties we want to check. All right. So now that we have seen all these uh, examples here of intermediate representations, what are the trade-offs? When do I use a control flow graph versus when do I use an abstract syntax tree? Why do I need to use a three address code? And should I use that more often than using an abstract syntax tree? Um, we're gonna talk about some of these trade-offs right now. Um, I'm gonna compare a high level IR with a low level IR. So a high level IR is something that is closer uh, to the source level, let's say an AST for example, uh, a low-level IR is something that is low uh, uh, in, in, in the compilation uh, chain. Let's say, I don't know, like bytecode, whether that is JVM uh, or bitcode, if you're using LLVM, for example. Ah, I can't write LLVM. So, a high level IR, just by definition, since it's closer to the source level, is language specific. If you have a high level IR, if you have an abstract syntax tree for a C program, you're probably not going to use the same structure for a functional language like Haskell. You're not going to use the same structure for a dynamic language like JavaScript. The abstract syntax trees are going to be substantially different between them. But a low level IR, like JVM bytecode or bitcode, for example, is going to be language independent because it's way further away from the source level and further and, and closer to uh, the machine code that is going to be executed. So for example, in, in Bitcode and LLVM, you can have whatever source language that LLVM supports and the all are going to be uh, represented using the same IR, low level IR, which is LLVM Bitcode inside the compiler. High level IR, Again, because it's further away from the machine and closer to the source language, it is machine independent. Low level IR, because it's closer to when the executable machine code is going to be generated, is machine specific. High level IR, just like the AST or the control flow graph, called CFG for short, is going to be some sort of a tree or a graph structure. Something too abstract to represent the details in the program. Low-level IR is typically some sort of an instruction sequence, something like the three address code that we have seen, or something like bytecode, if you have seen Java bytecode, uh, or something like LLVM instructions, if you have looked at instructions that LLVM generates. 
the high level IR usually have proper control flow so you will you will get to understand that this is a for loop this is a while loop this is a do while uh, this is a back edge from uh, to check the condition of the for loop. However, these kind of distinctions just vanish when you look at a low-level IR because basically everything is a go-to instruction at that point because you don't have those high-level language constructs that you can reason about anymore. Everything is lower down to something common enough that can support multiple different languages that can compile to that low-level intermediate representation. In a high-level IR, you can have compound expressions which means that you can have something like, so what do I mean by compound expression? You can have sum equals sum plus 2 times A of I, just like the example we saw, right? So this is a compound expression because you have one expression, you add that to another expression, and the addition is assigned through another expression to some variable sum. In a, in a low-level IR, you will never have that you will have that expression reduced or uh, expanded into simpler expressions. So you'll have things like, well, first, I need actually to read A of I, right? And assign that to some value temp, let's call it T. And then I'm going to have T1 is going to be 2 times T. And then T2 is going to be sum plus T1. And then T and then sum is going to be equals to T2. So you're going to break that compound expression into much simpler expressions, such that, for example, in the three address code uh, intermediate representation, you, can all, you only can manipulate or you can only deal with three addresses at most at the same time in the same instruction. And it just makes things simpler to reason about uh, at that point uh, in, 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 in the intermediate representation. The last thing uh, that I want to talk about in, the, in those trade-offs is in a high-level IR, you have high-level constructs like for loop, while, conditions. Uh, so you can deduce those high-level constructs. Uh, in a low-level IR, you have those constructs desugared or expanded into simpler constructs that can be uh, uh, reasoned about or expressed in fewer types of instructions as much as possible. So this is a, a comparison between uh, a high-level IR and a low-level IR with some examples here of what a high-level IR is, like a control flow graph or an abstract syntax tree, low-level IR like bitcode, LLVM bitcode, or JVM bytecode, and with what are the properties that are unique to each one of them that would help you choose which way you want to go uh, when you write down your analysis framework or you write down your analysis. Do you have any questions for me so far? And I think we are getting close actually to halfway through the class. So I think this might be a good point to maybe have a break for a few minutes. Uh, make sure that, I usually say that in class, but it still applies here in our virtual world. Make sure that you stand up, stretch your legs, move around. Uh, and then maybe we're going to uh, reconvene in about two minutes or so. So that's going to be uh, one ten p.m. Uh, Edmonton time. Uh, I'll still be here on Zoom if you have any questions for those couple of minutes. Uh, and I'll also be on the live chat uh, as well on, on the stream chat on the live stream on Twitch. Uh, all right, so f more questions are coming in. Machine specific, could you give some clarification on this? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing you mean the low level IR is machine specific. Okay, so let's say, uh, for example, a low level IR like, um, um, because pretty much the next step after that low level IR is going to be to generate the binary code or the machine code that is going to be executed, you probably cannot use that uh, low level IR for multiple different architectures in the same way, right? If you're going to generate x86, for example, out of your IR, uh, you cannot do the same process or you cannot reuse the same infrastructure to generate uh, ARM uh, uh, machine code, or you cannot use it to generate PowerPC machine code, or you cannot use it to generate uh, MIPS machine code, because these are substantially different. 
So it is getting closer now to where the hardware is going to see the program and start to execute it. So you won't be able to be machine independent as you are in a higher level language like in Java. Like when you write code in Java or Scala or Python, you don't really care that much about the machine that you're going to run your program on. You care about the program at hand right now. And this is one of the really good things uh, that languages do in general, which is abstraction. You abstract away from the hardware that you're, you, you are uh, going to be executing on and you let the compiler worry about that for you. But when the compiler gets to the point of having a low level IR, then now you are getting closer to the machine. So some things may be uh, a little bit tricky to deal with at that point. So that's what I mean by machine specific. <coughs> Excuse me. Shouldn't bytecode be machine independent? So that's true. JVM bytecode is machine independent. Uh, and that's why it might not actually be a good example of a low level IR. Uh, but once you have the JVM bytecode, it still has to be lowered down further by the uh, Java runtime environment to be executed or to be translated into binary uh, machine code to be executed on each machine. And that's why the premise of Java is you write your code once in Java and you can execute anywhere is mostly true because you will get JVM bytecode, yes, and you can transport it between machines, but then you have to have a different runtime for Java on each machine you're going to run it on because that runtime will be responsible for lowering down that common IR or common intermediate representation, which is the JVM bytecode, lower it down to the corresponding architecture that this runtime is currently executing on. So if you have uh, the Java runtime or the, or the runtime environment for Java or the JRE uh, for x86, it's not going to be the same as on Mac OS or Darwin. It's not going to be the same as on Windows. It's not going to be the same as on Linux. They are all going to be different. I hope that answers your question. Good. Right. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So to make things a little bit more practical here, now that we have seen sample analyses and intermediate representations, let's take a case study. And in this case study, I'm going to show you some intermediate representations that are used in one of the most famous frameworks, uh, static analysis frameworks called SUT, uh, for analyzing Java and Android applications and seeing how those design decisions may come in play when you design such an analysis framework. So the general workflow here is going to be the following. You're going to parse the method, whether it's source, whether it's bytecode, whatever it is, you're going to parse the method and you want to convert it to a control flow graph, a high level IR. Remember, this is the first thing we want to do. We want to generate a control flow graph or a CFG out of it then nodes are going to be simplified statements. So they, they are not necessarily the same statements in their same structure in the high level language, but they're going to be some simplified form of it. And edges are going to be possible or potential control flows between those nodes and those simplified statements. So nodes are going to be statements, edges are going to be the control flow on how the flow, uh, how the control flows from one statement to the other or from one group of statements to the other. So let's take an example. So on the left hand side here we have this Java program. It's just a straight line of code. Y equals X, if else statement, a couple of assignment statements. And on the left, on the right hand side here we have the corresponding uh, control for graph of it. So uh, this is the first statement. This is the if condition. If true, you're going to execute X equals Y. If false, you're going to execute Z equals 2. 
and then we have to somehow join the result from both control flow edges and to B equals Y and then execute A equals Z. Pretty straightforward uh, conversion here. And in general, a CFG or a control flow graph is an over approximation of what the potential runtime behavior of a programmer. So now you're starting to see Rice's theorem kicking in again here. And this is probably the first point you're going to see in the, in, in the course where we are trying now to over approximate what the potential runtime behavior of the program is because we cannot reason about it statically, otherwise, we're going to solve uh, the halting problem. So, why is that? We can see the following here. So, this is another program with a slightly different control flow graph. So, in this control flow graph, we have the following. So, we have y equals x, that's fine. If condition, if it's true, we're going to execute this. False, we're going to execute that. And then, if this is true, we're going to execute this. False, we're going to execute that. And then, we're going to merge again here. And then, we're going to execute a equals z. If you notice here, depending on how complex that predicate P is, uh, sorry, that predicate, yes, P is, uh, we may not infer actually that these branches are mutually exclusive, right? So here I'm just saying, I'm just writing that this is P and this is not P. Of course, both of them cannot be true at the same time. But it is easy for us to see that right now because we are just looking at this as one predicate P, so it might be just one flag. But this could be actually a method call, right? Or it could be a combination of uh, other Boolean flags that when combined together, they are going to boil down to P and not P. So you might not be able to, to infer that immediately at compile time or at static time uh, without doing further analysis and further investigation from your analysis. Uh, maybe doing some constant propagation would help. Uh, maybe doing some um, code, dead code elimination or, 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 or other uh, sort of optimizations would help. But the point is, depending on the complexity of that predicate, it might not be easy to infer that these are mutually exclusive. So this is, this is an example here. If is prime, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, and the second uh, condition if is prime, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3. So this is a very um, extensive or intensive operation to execute. You cannot just immediately get the answer to that right away. So what are some of the lessons learned uh, so far? You can almost always uh, guarantee, or not guarantee, like in, in, in the general case, control flow graphs have to guarantee, have to guarantee all potential runtime behavior of the program. So they're going to be conservative, which means there might be some edges in the control flow graph that represent maybe invalid uh, runtime paths or invalid paths that may not happen at runtime. But you're just adding them there for completeness, for the sake of covering up any possible potential runtime behavior of a program. <coughs> which means that if the control may flow from statement A to statement B, then there is an edge from A to B. It doesn't mean that this flow will happen at runtime, it just means that it may happen at runtime. But the opposite is not true. So if the flow may not happen at runtime, there will be no edge between A and B. And the reason why we have this is that, like I said before, this is an undecidable problem to determine whether this flow may happen from A to B without basically executing every single possible execution of that program whatsoever with all possible inputs and then deciding after that whether this is going to work or not. So in real life, uh, control flow graphs um, even contain some edges for something like exceptions which we know as developers do not happen every single time you run the program. Otherwise, it's going to be a really buggy program that you really don't want to write and don't want to ship or deploy whatsoever. Um, so does that mean that uh, this flow will happen every single time? No, it just means that the control flow graph includes it for completeness because it may happen in some cases at runtime. So it must be there present in the control flow graph. Otherwise, the control flow graph will be incomplete 
which in programming languages or program analysis we say it would be unsound. So unsound is here means it's going to be an incomplete control for graph. It's going to be missing some potential runtime behavior of the application and that's going to make it unsound. All right, so now we have an important decision to make. So what are the statements or the nodes that we're going to allow uh, or not allow in, in, in our control for graph? So we, what goes into a control for graph? So on the one extreme, we have Java source code. So for example, here in this code, you have a simple method bar that does a bunch of computations and an if and else statement. And then you have a system out print line X. And if you go right now to your Eclipse or your other favorite Java editor and copy this piece of code there, uh, you're going to have value of x is undefined error. Why? Because it will see that x is only defined in that if statement, but not in the else statement. So when you get to print line here x, x may not have a value. So this is one extreme. So one major problem here is that another problem with Java source code is uh, statements and classes in the source level may be nested. So you might have multiply nested uh, for loops, for example, <coughs> with even further nesting like having anonymous classes that have methods implemented in them and those methods can have their own anonymous classes implemented in them and so on and so forth. Things are a little bit easier when you go to the bytecode because these are going to be um, uh, expanded into uh, uh, into separate uh, classes, but in the source level, this is a really one extreme uh, of of the language. On the other extreme, though, so if you are talking about the Java language on one end, on the other end, on the other extreme, we have the Java bytecode, which is one of the other intermediate representations that you will see or use uh, in the Java world. So, what are the advantages of Java bytecode? Well. There is no nesting. It's a sequential, basically, list of instructions or sequence of instructions. You can still have go-tos and whatnot, but it's a sequence of instructions. There are no nesting. Inner classes are even expanding, expanded into their own classes. Anonymous classes are expanded into their own separate classes and so on. Uh, one statement follows the other. Uh, looping and branches, just like a low-level IR, are implemented using go-to statements. So there are no weird control flow uh, shenanigans there. Nested classes, like I said, are flattened into normal classes. Disadvantages, on the other hand, are the following. You're going to have no local variables if you deal with Java bytecode. Uh, you're going to only deal with a stack. So stack variables uh, or any operations that need temporary variables are going to be operated uh, or performed on a stack. And you have to reason about that stack somehow and figure out how many, for example, variables and instruction would need to pop from the stack and push on the stack after the instruction is done uh, to be able to perform its operation properly. The other disadvantage, kind of, is that for Java bytecode, there is more than 200 bytecode instructions in there that you need to implement in your analysis. So there is a wide variety of instructions that you need to implement. But on the other hand, you don't have to implement a, a parser for Java. If you talk about another language like C or C++, it's even worse. Like You don't want to really implement a parser for C++ uh, to be able to just get the abstract syntax tree for it. Uh, you might as well just uh, use one of the off-the-shelf parsers for C++ for that matter. But in the, case, in the case study that we're looking at here right now, for if you want to do that for Java bytecode, you're going to have to support about 200 uh, possible bytecode instructions or even more. So for example, this is, if this is the code that we're looking at, this is going to be the bytecode that corresponds to it. So here you're going to see things like uh, a D store, you're storing something into a double, um, and D load, you're loading uh, a double value, um, and then a D mul, so you're multiplying, so that D mul here is multiplying these two values together, right? Uh, and then D to I, so D to I means a double to int. So you are typecasting or downcasting a double value into an integer value. Uh, and then and so on and so forth. Um, 
So that's one thing here, one example here. So you're popping and multiplying two operands on the stack, place the result on the stack again. You can see also from that sequence of instruction of bytecode instructions is that you don't have any temporary variables. Everything is done on the stack and, and it's the semantics of the instruction is what gives you uh, the, 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 the kind of operation you should do. So the semantics of a DMAL means, well, you're going to pop two elements from the stack or to the top two variables of the stack, multiply them together, and then you push the result back on the stack. D2I means you're just going to convert the type uh, of the element on the top of the stack from double to integer, and so on and so forth. You all also notice here is that um, many instructions are overloaded. So you'll see A load, I load, D load, they're all types of loading constant values, constant integer-like values. Um, one, for, uh, one for loading, uh, one for loading uh, 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 integer values, I load, uh, D load is for loading uh, um, double values, uh, and A load for loading uh, references as well. So essentially the same operation has multiple implementations. Now that's Java bytecode. Let's have a look at Android bytecode and how it might be different or similar to Java bytecode. It is quite similar. It is very similar actually to Java bytecode, but there are some differences and some key differences between both. So one is in Android bytecode, we don't have an operand stack. Instead, we do have some logical registers that we can use uh, instead of the operand stack. So if you are familiar with uh, the MIPS architecture or uh, the RISC-V architecture even uh, from 2 to 9, if you have taken 2 to 9, uh, the compiler architecture course, or any other compiler architecture course that you have taken, uh, you, there in your, in your uh, assembly programming language, you're dealing with registers. Android bytecode is pretty much the same. You're dealing with registers instead of uh, operand stack. If you're also familiar with LLVM bitcode, um, there you're also dealing with registers instead of dealing with an operand stack. Uh, in Android bytecode, some values are untyped. In Java, all those values are typed. Example here is in, in Android bytecode, some examples of those untyped uh, values would be numerical constants that are not known before their first use because you don't know what value they're going to hold. So you don't have a type in the f before the first use. Um, something that is kind of fun is that zero in the Android bytecode might mean many different things. It might mean zero. So this is the integer value. It might mean 0f, which means an integer floating point value, which again, from your computer architecture course, you know that this is not exactly the same as 0, the integer value. Or it might mean a null reference. In Java bytecode, these are different. You're going to have different values for those. But again, it's roughly about 250 bytecode instructions. So it's not that different compared to the Java bytecode. And it also includes uh, optimized DEX or ODEX uh, 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 structure uh, for the bytecode. So now we have two slightly different or uh, two types of uh, bytecodes that uh, are similar in certain aspects, but there are some differences between them. And we want to implement uh, and we are going to show, um, uh, I'm going to show you right now an intermediate representation uh, from an analysis framework SOOT that is called Jimple that is capable of representing both bytecodes or translating both bytecodes or consuming them as input to translate them into that intermediate representation that then could be operated on by the analysis engine SOOT, uh, which we will get to see actually in one of the hands-on lectures uh, when we talk about call graphs later in the course. Before I show that, uh, does anyone have any questions so far?
great. Thumbs up. All right, cool. So I take it, no questions. If you do have a question and you think it's going to take you a bit of time to write it up, just send a quick yes or something that I have a question so that I can wait for you until you type it up. I'm more than happy to accommodate that just so that I know before I move on to the next segment or the next point that I would like to talk about. Uh, rather than you typing up the whole question and then I come back to it later when it's out of context. So I'd rather answer the question within context rather than waiting until later. Uh, but anyways, it seems that uh, for this part of the lecture there are no further questions, so I'll just move on to the next point, which is now that we have seen an example of, uh, sorry, Android bytecode and Java bytecode and the differences and similarities between them, uh, let's take an example of an intermediate representation that is capable of representing both, which is Jimple. So why is it called Jimple in the first place? Well, it is like Java, similar to Java as a language, so this is where the J comes from, but it's simpler than that. So this is the impl part of Jimple. And it combines the best of both worlds. So you have local variables, you don't have any stack variables like in bytecode, but you have local variables like source code. So there are no stack operations anymore. So things are pretty clear in the three address code. And there are specific dedicated variables for the special uh, local variables like this, which is the this reference in virtual methods, and the parameter store method, so that you are able to distinguish between those types of variables and the uh, other variables, local variables in the program. And there are only simple statements that we're going to deal with. So there are no nesting like in a source level language. Everything is expanded again and flattened out in its own separate classes. And there are no nested uh, definitions uh, in, 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 in Jimpl. So let's take an example here. So this is the method foo in Java. And this is going to be this part here is going to be the Jimple representation of that method foo. So here you'll see that this variable is there, definition for d1 and d2, explicit definitions of d1 and d2. And you will notice here those temp instruction, uh, temp local variables. So those are the ones that represent stack operations in the bytecode. So have we, had we seen this as a bytecode, as a list of bytecode instructions, you're not going to see those 10 variables because these are going to, represent it, to be represented implicitly by the operations done on the stack. But now that we are using Jimpl, everything has to be explicit, so all variables have to be explicit and we're going to use those. And here you're going to see an explicit definition of the this parameter. You're going to even see a virtual invoke instruction explicitly expanded here by telling you that this is a type of the invocation is virtual invoke. So this is the virtual invoke type. What is the signature of the method that you're calling? And then the parameters that are you going to pass to those methods. And even the return of, an, of a method is have to be there, has to be there, even though it's a void, it's returning void, but it's a return void uh, instruction anyways. So everything is explicit. Variables are explicitly declared even the this parameter. Special references like this and the parameters are uh, uh, implemented and are shown explicitly in the code. <clears throat> there are no stack operations. Instead, everything is done through assignment statements instead of operating on the stack. And you're always going to have complex statements like this one here broken down into simpler instructions and simpler expressions. So here, this one statement is split into two statements such that at most you're going to have one reference on the left-hand side and at most two references on the right-hand side. And this is basically what I meant before by three address code. So three address code is at most you have one reference on the left-hand side and at most you have two references on the right-hand side. And that's what makes it three address code. You have at most three addresses or three references in one instruction. The method calls are fully resolved, so you have the explicit this reference as well as part of the method call itself. Um, 
And here's a, here I'm going to show a quick comparison between the Java bytecode against that Jimper representation. So bytecode, each instruction has an implicit effect on the stack that you may not see. It just has to come from the semantics of the instruction. And just looking at the instruction doesn't immediately tells you what the instruction is doing. You have to look up a manual of some sort. And in this case, it's going to be the Java specification or the JVM specification manual to figure out what happens after this instruction. In Jimple, each statement will act explicitly on a named variable. Nothing is happening implicitly. Everything is explicit in the instruction and specified by the instruction itself. In bytecode, there are no types for stack locations. You just say, I'm taking this from the stack, I'm putting this on the stack. In Jimple, every local variable has a type. You cannot have a local variable without a type. In bytecode, there's about 200 or a little bit more than 200 kinds of instructions that you need to support. But in Jimple, and this is a key feature of it, is that it logically groups those types of instructions into only 15 types of statements. So all those overloaded statements that you have seen in bytecode, whether in Java or, 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 or Android, are going to be grouped into logical groups and types of statements. So you, can, you only need to support 15 statements in Jimple. So let's say your analysis, uh, you are, you're going to add a new feature to your analysis. You don't have to implement that feature for 200 instructions. You only need to do that for 15 instructions. And this is, again, one of the key features of having intermediate representations in general, is that you're trying to abstract away from the language-specific or machine-specific uh, concepts into something that is of a higher level that would enable you to easily add more features in the future, maintain your current features, consolidate implementation of certain aspects of your analysis so that you don't have to uh, spread yourself thin when you implement new features in the analysis. Uh, for your analysis, sorry. So now that we have talked about Jimple, it is part of the suit infrastructure. Uh, it's worth saying that the suit infrastructure uh, was, uh, is, sorry, a free compiler infrastructure and it is written in Java for analyzing Java and Android applications. Uh, it's under LGPL and it has a very, very active open source community. It's one of the most successful uh, stories of open source uh, projects that came out of academia, uh, specifically from the programming language community. Uh, and it came out of actually the university, McGill University in, 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 um, in Montreal uh, by, uh, from the group by the late Laurie Hendren uh, over 15 years ago or 20 years ago even. I think it was 1999 when, when Soot first came about. Uh, and it has been a vibrant community ever since, uh, used by people from industry, from academia, researchers, students all over the world. Like I just said, it was originally designed to analyze and compile and transform Java bytecode and not necessarily as a static analysis framework. Uh, and the original motivation was to actually provide a common uh, infrastructure uh, such that uh, researchers can compare uh, analyses to each other, primarily points to analyses uh, to each other. And since then, it has been extended quite extensively by many people around the world uh, to include things like decompilation, visualizations, and so on and so forth. So what is the SOOT framework? It has many potential applications, or you can implement it in, uh, you can use it in various ways. Uh, you can use it as a standalone application from the command line or Eclipse plugin. I don't recommend using the Eclipse plugin because it's way outdated, so just use it from the command line if you want. Um, you can also extend it to include your own IRs, intermediate representations, on top of, uh, on, instead of Jimple. Suit itself has actually multiple IRs in there. Uh, there's at least three or four types of intermediate representations there. Uh, uh, the framework is extensible enough that you can implement your own analyses uh, or your own code transformations or your own code visualizations and Im integrate it within, the, uh, within the, uh, the phase options of Suit such that you can run it within the current uh, analysis infrastructure that Soot has in a very seamless way. Um, and you can also use it as the basis of uh, new special purpose tools. So you can build your own analysis tools on top of Soot and make Soot your analysis engine that powers any kind of analysis queries you want to answer or you want to 
get results for uh, on the piece of on, on, on your input code. This is a general overview of uh, the SUT analysis infrastructure. Um, so you basically can take multiple input languages. Uh, you can take whatever input language that you want, maybe Java source, you compile it through Java C, uh, SML source, you compile it through MLJ, Scheme, which is a function language, you can compile it through Kawa, uh, Eiffel, which is another language. Any of those languages, you can compile it to class file, which is basically JVM bytecode. And then once it's compiled into class files, Soot is able to consume that class file, produce Jimpl, which is three address code, can analyze the Jimpl, optimize it, and tag it. So enrich the imprimary representation with multiple uh, information. Then it can also generate bytecode at the end. So one thing that Soot is, is capable of doing is it can also generate bytecode or Android APK. So you can put in an Android APK, do some code transformation like deobfuscation or obfuscation, or maybe some annotations or some tagging or some code transformations like optimizations, and then generate your code out of it as well. So you can generate it either for the interpreter, which is the regular JRE or Java runtime environment. Uh, you can JIT your code. You can use it with other types of engines and other types of uh, 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 backends uh, that you want to use your generated code out of, uh, for. You can do the same as well with Android. So you can just get an Android APK, transform it into Jimpl, and uh, then use that Jimpl code uh, to analyze the Android application. So uh, FlowDroid is the part of Soot that, or the, the famous analysis framework that is based on top of Soot that does uh, uh, analyze Android applications on top of the Jimpl IR. So the types of Jimpl statements, just to give you a brief overview of those types, like I said, there are 15 types of Jimpl statements instead of more than 200 instructions in bytecode. Uh, you have core statements like NOP statements, which just means uh, no operation, uh, definition statements, identity statements, assignment statements, you have some statements that represent intra-procedural control flow, so any control flow within a single method, intra-procedure, within the procedure, within the method, like if statements, go to statements, table switch statements, or lookup switch statements. And then you have inter-procedural statements, control flow uh, at the border of the procedure or external to the procedure, like invoke statements, because you're gonna go to another method, return statements and return void statements. You have throw statements for exceptions. Um, you have ret statements, and this is currently not used. It's just deprecated from a very old standard in Java and not used anymore, but it's there for historical reasons. Um, uh, we also have monitor statements uh, and uh, enter monitor and exit monitor that are basically used for mutual exclusion and synchronization. Uh, if you wanna execute synchronized blocks of, uh, of code, um, you have identity statements that basically um, defines, serves two purposes. It's used for assigning parameter values and this to uh, locals and it gives each local at least one definition point that you can go back to uh, in your analysis and you're gonna need, you're gonna see why, what do I mean by that exactly when we talk about backwards analysis and forwards analysis uh, two lectures from today? Uh, maybe either late on Thursday next week or Tuesday the week after that. So this is an example of uh, the representation of identity statements in Jimple uh, to show you how we can use it to define the this parameter and the first argument to a method or parameter zero. This is an, another example of Jimple statement for a foo method. You have the definitions for all the locals. You have the identity statements here. Uh, here you have an if statement and you can see that everything is implemented as a go to statement, all the jumps. Here you have some assignment statement. You have an invoke statement. Here you have a return statement uh, to return a value. And here's the label that will be the target of that go to statement, for example. And this will be created by uh, and that label is basically something that the, 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 the Jimple printer will create so that it creates a human readable 
uh, uh, output uh, that could be consumed by either the analysis engineer or anybody who would like to debug the kind of code that you're generating here. So browsing Gimpel, uh, if you go to the Soot website and figure out uh, how you want to use it, basically there are four or five different major classes that you would be interested in. There is the scene, which is the basic scene where everything happens in the analysis uh, world. Uh, you can get a Soot class and that gives you a Soot class object. You can either get a method or get a field out of it and getting a field will give you a Soot field, getting a method will get you a Soot method where you can explore further what that field is, you can resolve it to a, to a concrete field, you can figure out its signature, its name, its type, and the same thing for a method, and it's in the method you can have also its arguments and the types of the arguments and the body of the method through get active body, and then that will give you a Gimple body where you can iterate over the instructions of that body to figure out what those instructions are. Within the body you can get the units or the instructions as a chain, some type of internal list for suit. You can also get the local variables. You can also get the traps, which are the exceptional flow in the method. Uh, so these are the three types of chains that are related to a method body in Gimpel that would allow you to explore the behavior of the, of the, of the method and what it is doing. Getting a control flow graph, there are multiple ways to do it. I'm just going to mention one of them. Uh, you can get a brief unit call graph. Uh, brief unit graph, sorry, and that will return an object of type unit graph where you can explore the control flow graph of a method uh, as we have discussed earlier in the class today. There's another type of graph, uh, CFG, that you can get which is exceptional uh, unit graph which is basically a unit graph with modeling exceptions as well. So you can have uh, modeling for any potential exceptions that could be thrown at runtime uh, in that method. And these are some of the main operations you can get in the unit graph. You can get the body that it represents. You can get the heads. You can have multiple heads for the unit graph. Because again, uh, as you're going to see later, you can have a backwards analysis that basically goes backwards from bottom to top in the control for graph. So you can end up uh, starting from different heads if you have multiple return values. You can get tails. Again, if you're doing a forwards analysis, you will be going to multiple different endpoints of the method or return statements of the method. So you can have either multiple heads or multiple tails. Uh, um, like, I, like I said, and we are going to see examples of those when we talk about backwards analysis and forwards analysis in, in two to three lectures from today. You can get the predecessors of any unit in the unit graph. This is the way you're going to uh, uh, navigate through the control for graph. And you can also, of course, get the successors of any unit uh, or statement basically in the unit graph. So this is pretty much it for today. Uh, so let's quickly summarize what we uh, talked about in, in today's lecture. Uh, so we have seen that in intermediate representations and various types of them and how they can abstract from concrete uh, input languages into some other abstractions that allow us to reason uh, uh, e more easily about uh, the input program so that we can run our analysis on top of those intermediate representations. We have seen a case study of those intermediate representations uh, in terms of abstract syntax trees, the address code, and so on, but more specifically we saw a case study for Java and Android, which is Gimple, as an intermediate language that is of type three address code format. Most things are explicit in Gimpel, no implicit stack operations, for example. Every statement is atomic, meaning no compound expressions. Everything is expanded and simplified. There is no nesting. Everything is flattened out. Simplifies the notations of flow functions, which we're going to start talking about in our lecture uh, next week. So our next topic for next week is going to be lattices and fixed points. And I expect that topic to go, I think, two to three lectures depending on how things will go and in that topic we're going to explore now that we have talked about intermediate representations how can we get from that point where we can represent the input program into some format into having an analysis that can basically given a method and given an analysis and given a property can this analysis tell us whether this property holds or not on that specific statement. So this is how we're going to do it uh, using lattice theory and fixed points uh, starting with our next lecture next week. 
Um, that's all I had for you today, folks. Um, in the next minute or two, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, um, either on Zoom or in the stream chat on Twitch. All right, so if there are no questions, uh, thank you all for joining me today. And I hope uh, and I look forward to seeing you all on Tuesday next week. Uh, please remember to check out the assignment, the first assignment, assignment one. Uh, you'll find it on eClass. And I remind you also that uh, everything, every single assignment has a rubric associated with it uh, on, on eClass. So check it out as well so that you know exactly how the assignment is going to be graded by EFAS uh, and what is expected from you in the assignment. If you have any questions, please, please do not hesitate to contact us either through the eClass forum, which is my strong recommendation. Uh, but if you feel that you just want to reach out to EFAS or myself privately, that's also fine. Just email us, any either of us. I will be more than happy to help you out. Uh, we're here for you. Uh, we're here to accommodate anything that you need to make this an enjoyable course and an enjoyable semester for you. So please don't hesitate to reach out for us if you need anything. Thank you all. Uh, have an enjoy your weekend. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice long weekend, actually. And I will see you on Tuesday. And stay safe and healthy, everyone.